this is a paper uh, about uh, the effects of climate change on labor and capital relocation and will bring uh, evidence uh, from Brazil. The co-authors are uh, Christoph Albert, who is in Colegio Carlo Alberto, and uh, Jacopo Ponticelli, who is at Northwestern University. Uh, so let, let me start uh, with the motivation. You know, there is a clear idea, especially after this summer. Uh, I think presenting this paper after this summer is very different from before the summer because I don't have to explain many things that we have experienced. Uh, but one of the uh, effects of climate change that scientists have been stressing is the increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events uh, such as uh, you know, heat waves, uh, droughts, and floods. And these events, uh, you know, but developing countries have been already particularly exposed to these events. So in rich countries, maybe this is a special summer um, uh, where, you know, we have clearly experienced uh, this, uh, you know, this extreme uh, weather. But in developing countries have been already experiencing this uh, in the past. Why? Because uh, tropical areas are more affected. Uh, by this uh, warming. I'll show you this in a second. Uh, this means that um, we can look at the data from these countries uh, in the recent years to start understanding what are the consequences of uh, climate change and how uh, you know, different economies can, can adapt. Uh, another reason why developing countries are uh, particularly exposed is that they tend to have a large employment share in agriculture, which is the sector most directly affected uh, in terms of productivity by the changes in climate. And a second is that uh, if you think of any standard um, international trade or economic geography model, what would be the response to climate change? Usually uh, there is a change in comparative advantage. If you have, for example, a drought that decreases agricultural productivity, you would expect that a, a region sh shifts comparative advantage towards uh, manufacturing or traded services. This involves a relocation of capital and labor uh, across uh, sectors. A second response that could be emphasized by a, an economic geography model is uh, movements of population. If an area uh, faces a negative uh, you know, a change in the weather that reduces uh, productivity, what you would expect is that labor flows out of that area and relocates towards other areas. Same story with investment and capital. So these are the two uh, classic responses that you would expect. Uh, developing countries are characterized by frictions in these uh, labor and capital markets, so this relocation process might not be as easy as in rich countries. So that's another reason why we are interested in looking at the experience of these, of these countries. So what is the existing evidence? Uh, there is uh, uh, evidence on the effects of adverse uh, weather conditions on local economic activity in developing countries and on migration. Uh, our focus here is going to be the relocation of labor and capital across sectors and regions. So we will look at the uh, sectoral relocation that is predicted by classic uh, trade models focusing on comparative advantage. And the second uh, contribution is going to look at the spillover effects on destination regions. So what happens with regions that are connected to regions experiencing droughts, for example, through labor or capital markets, and then, um, yes? No funciona? Pues me lo pongo en el vestido igual. Sí, no, no. Pues desde que se para la luz, se va a ir. Ahí. Ok. Um, ok, so that, that's the second focus of the paper, this effect on destination regions. So we'll basically look at the effect of excess dryness, um, and that's going to be our measure of, of climate change. So let me stop one second here. So the idea is going to be looking at deviations 
of the weather in a certain area relative to the 100-year average. Okay, so these are going to be, we're going to look at deviations during a decade. So the idea is that you are experiencing a decade that is dry relative to the last century. And that's going to be our measure of climate change, how people adapt to these anomalies that are persistent uh, in time. It's not just a bad year, but it's a bad decade. So w the first is the direct effect on the local economy of the affected regions. We'll call those origin, uh, you know, because we will use this framework of trade and geography to, to think about, about this. So we'll think of this origin, which are the, the regions that are affected by uh, dryness. And then the indirect effect, which is in the economy of these regions integrated, and we'll use two measures of economic integration across regions within a country. The first is going to be a measure of capital market integration, and for that we'll rely on something we did in a previous work, which was to uh, build a connection between all the municipalities in Brazil using uh, the bank branch network. So the idea is that uh, if two municipalities have branches of the same bank, they are going to be connected through capital markets with the idea that the, there's some friction in the interbank market so that these internal capital markets make it easier to reallocate capital across regions. So that's going to be our measure of capital market integration. And then uh, for labor, we'll use a classic migrant network um, measure, which basically looks at how many migrants in a given destination came in the past uh, from a given origin. And this measure, we're going to lag it for a decade to avoid endogeneity. So this is going to be the historical, uh, let's say, bank branch network and the historical migrant network. Uh, so uh, the setting is going to be Brazil in the last uh, two decades, which are interesting from the climate point of view, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, we'll uh, bring some new data on disaster reports on droughts, so we digitized uh, federal information at the municipality level on, on the occurrence of these natural disasters. Uh, and then, you know, to, uh, ensure exogeneity because the first measure, I mean, is good because it tells you which type of weather conditions were perceived as negative by, by local and federal authorities. Uh, however, you know, there might be endogeneity concerns, so we use also a meteorological measure of excess dryness uh, relative to the historical average, which is the, the SPE. This is basically an index developed by a climatologist that takes into account temperature and rainfall to construct a dryness index um, relative to this 100-year uh, average. So that's what we use. And finally, we'll look at, look at um, agricultural output, uh, capital reallocation. Why do we look at agricultural output? Because our setting is one where we think of a shock, the, the weather shock affecting agricultural productivity and then all the effects that that uh, builds into the system. Okay, so that's our main outcome. Uh, a second is capital reallocation. Uh, we're going to use bank branch balance sheet data from the S-Band data set. And for labor reallocation, we use uh, the, both the population census and the employer-employee data in RISE. So wh what are going to be the main uh, findings? So a first is that um, a full decade of excess dryness relative to historical averages. So when you have a decade that has been uh, dry relative to the 100-year uh, average before, uh, we see large reallocation of both capital and labor away from these affected regions, as you would expect from an economic geography model. Uh, this is consistent with expect an expected permanent reduction in agricultural productivity. So this means that um, you know, this is not perceived as a temporary shock, uh, first thing. And second, something that, uh, you know, is argued sometimes that it's a, there's a lot of adaptation responses. So if you get drier, then you're going to change crops or you're going to move to a different technology, etc. What we observe is not consistent with that idea of easy local adaptation. Uh, it appears that adap local adaptation is not easy and then we observe large 
reductions in agricultural productivity and large outmigration. So th that's kind of the first uh, message uh, of the paper, that uh, these are large effects and adaptation doesn't seem to be an easy strategy, at least in this time frame that we are looking at. Uh, second, we observe changes in the structure of the economy. Uh, here, um, the effects are as in classic, you know, three-sector open economy models, a classic is uh, Corden and Neary, 1982. So what do you get there? If you have a model with uh, three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing that are traded, and services that is non-traded, you have a reduction in agricultural productivity, what you expect, you expect that the region gains comparative advantage in manufacturing, so workers should relocate towards manufacturing, uh, not towards services because you get a reduction in demand from, from services, so if most services are non-traded, the reduction in agricultural productivity reduces service demand. So we get a classic Gordon and Neary prediction that uh, within regions, labor relocates towards the manufacturing sector, which should be gaining comparative advantage relative to uh, manufacturing, to agriculture. Uh, a second uh, finding is that, you know, most workers do not go to the local manufacturing sector but live in the region, workers that uh, lose jobs in agriculture. And these workers, when they move across regions, they don't go to the manufacturing sector in other regions, but they go to the agriculture and the service sector. Uh, we found this asymmetry uh, interesting, or at least you know, worth uh, exploring further. Uh, so the next part of the paper, what we do is try to understand this asymmetry. Why is it that these displaced workers from agriculture go to manufacturing locally, but when they move across regions, then they tend to go to agriculture and services? Uh, so for that, we ex use this FERB level data from RISE, and basically, what we do here is we construct a firm level version of the migrant network instrument that allows us to shock firms with exogenous climate migrant shocks. Okay, so basically the idea is that if a firm has employed in the past somebody that, you know, from a region that will be experiencing droughts in the future, right, then this firm is going to be more likely to get more migrants from that particular region. And that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, we show some uh, exogeneity uh, that this is a, an exogenous, uh, you know, climate migrant shock at the firm level. Some firms are going to react to the, that shock hiring workers and some firms are not going to react because even if there is a contact, I might not, not hire. So that's uh, the setting that, that we explore. And here we have two interesting findings. One is that uh, firms in the manufacturing sector are less connected to dry regions via migrant network. What does this mean? Uh, at the beginning we were shocked about this finding. I I'll tell you why. Because the weather shocks are as good as randomly assigned. Why? Because these weather shocks are deviations from a, the 100 year average. So all regions are equally likely to experience droughts. So we were not understanding why is the case that firms in manufacturing tend to be systematically less connected to these Brian regions. Um, on further explanation, exploration, we saw that this is because manufacturing is concentrated in space. This means that it's going to be on average less connected to any region because of this uh, concentration. This job market for manufacturing is much more concentrated. Uh, this, we, we think it's interesting because then it's gonna be more general than Brazil. In, in, this is gonna happen in any country because you know, manufacturing is always concentrated due to external economies of scale. Uh, so that, that is one friction that is going to make it hard for workers in agriculture to find jobs in manufacturing. And a second a finding is that conditional on being connected to this region, so even if they have a worker in the past that you know, came from this region, so it could have, you know, this referral network. This could, they are less likely to respond by hiring these workers. Uh, and here, you know, the, the, the explanation uh, that, you know, we're exploring further, but uh, this is what we, we are seeing in the data, is that um, there are differences in skills, um, you know, between manufacturing 
and agriculture. So even if they have connections, it's harder for these workers to, to get jobs in, in manufacturing. Okay, so that is, um, that is sort of the summary of the paper. And now I have only 10 minutes. So let me just show you uh, sort of the main, uh, the main findings in the data. So the first thing that uh, we, we think is interesting uh, and we found also surprising when we saw it is the evolution of the temperature in Brazil. So this is the temperature since 1920 uh, to 2020, so the last century. And as you see, since 1980, so, so this is, a, you know, we know there's an upward trend, but since 1980, this has taken a, a, a speed. And if you look at the, at the axis, the increase in temperature in the last 40 years is, uh, you know, somewhat larger than one degree, okay? So this uh, type of graphs, you wouldn't get it in Europe, right? In Europe, it's much flatter. So this is why uh, we can already study the effects of these changes in temperature on changes in climate. Such a steep change in temperature of one degree is going to have uh, effects on uh, drought conditions, uh, you know, and, and, and extreme weather events in, in Brazil that, uh, that we can already uh, study because we have quite a long uh, time span. Uh, then this is the data, the administrative data on the reported droughts. Uh, so um, let me just say that, you know, maybe you don't see it clearly here, but the decade between 2000 and 2010 was a relatively normal decade, while the second decade was a warm decade. Uh, and you, know, you see clearly the increase in the incidence of these droughts in this, in this time. And this is our instrument, or this measure of dryness relative to historical average. As you see, it's going to be different than the previous one, because this takes into account deviations from, uh, from the normal. The other is just a, you know, a drought event. And here, um, it, you, know, you also see how the second decade is, is much warmer. And this um, is a distribution of dryness. Uh, and again, this is the first decade and this is the second decade. And, and, and you see how the hotter decade has much more extreme weather events, okay? So this is just to show you the experiment, in a sense, we are constructing an experiment of the effects of climate change by looking at, you know, the effect of this steep uh, increase in temperature in Brazil and looking at uh, two decades, um, you know, one which could be more normal and the other, uh, you know, which is a clearly drier decade. So what we're going to do is compare regions across Brazil uh, that, uh, you know, are getting... Um, you know, more dryness relative to the historical average with respect to other regions that are not getting these shocks. Okay, so let me show you. So we have three sets of results, agriculture, capital, and labor. Um, let me show you quickly the results on agriculture. Um, the, everything I'll show you is a municipality going from the 50 to the 90 percentile of dryness, okay? So from being average conditions to being at the tail of the 90 percentile. Uh, so here what we get is a reduction of the value of production of around 8 percent in agriculture. This is overall, so this takes into account adjustment across crops, etc. Uh, but this is going to be highly nonlinear. So if you look at, these are the desires of dryness. If you look at the left of zero, it's quite flat, so a lot of uh, wetness is not bad for agriculture. Uh, but if you look at the right, um, you know, the 8, 9, and 10 percentile, you know, in the 10 percentile, you get a 20 percent reduction in output. So these are very large uh, effects. And again, um, yeah, so let me just not overemphasize this. So, so this is the first thing. We see very clear uh, reductions uh, in agricultural productivity. So how, does, how do capital flows respond? So here, our specification is going to have as outcomes uh, deposits, loans, and capital outflows. 
the way we'll measure capital outflows is by looking at the consolidated balance sheet of all the bank branches in a given municipality and looking at the difference between deposits and loans. So it's going to be a rough measure of, of capital flows uh, across these uh, municipalities. So, what, um, so those are going to be the outcomes. We have municipality time fixed effects. Dryness in the municipality is the direct effect, and exposure dryness is the indirect effect. And how do we calculate it? Um, you know, basically, I'm not going to have time to explain it in detail, but uh, the exposure of dryness, you're going to be more exposed if you have a lot of branches of banks that also have branches in municipalities suffering droughts. So you are connected through this bank branch network. So what do we see? In terms of, uh, so this is a municipality experiencing a, a year, a bad year. Okay, so let me compare a bad year with a bad decade. So if this municipality experiences a bad year, what we observe is an increase in loans and capital outflows. So this is what you would get from an insurance model. No, you're getting a temporary negative shock. You're getting a insurance. So you're getting, you know, loans. Where does this insurance come from? Uh, it's coming from um, you know, from municipalities that are connected because these experience capital outflow. So there is insurance from these municipalities that are connected to the municipalities that are suffering drought. This money is going to agriculture. So this insurance, this is a look, if you look at loans to non-agriculture, they don't change. All the money is going to an agriculture and it's coming from less loans to agriculture in other regions. So basically that's the way uh, you know, the insurance is working. They, you know, this is because of something particular in Brazil that they have a fixed amount they have to lend to agriculture, so they take it out from agriculture in other regions and they insure agriculture. So this is the yearly effect. But what happens when you have a bad decade? Okay, this is a bad year. When you have a bad decade, what you get is something very different, which is a 10% reduction in loans. Okay? So basically, no insurance. Uh, what does this mean? This is perceived as a permanent reduction in productivity. It doesn't seem that local um, you know, banks or uh, farmers think that they can adapt to these changes in climate by investing, changing crops, changing technology. What you see is basically a, a perception that this is a permanent reduction in agricultural productivity, that there's not much you can do, and you know, investment gets out of the area. Where, where does investment come from? Uh, you know, th this, sorry, this reduction in investment also affects the banks that are connected. So at the beginning we were shocked by that because it, why are also these uh, getting less loans? And we think it's because these banks have been insuring these regions because they thought it was a temporary shock. But then if you get a full decade of bad weather, then you will have a lot of non-performing loans, so you have less capital to lend, both in that region and also locally. So then it also has these negative spillover effects on investment in these regions that we're insuring them. Okay, so that's... Um, I'm stopping on these findings because I guess it's more interesting for, for this audience. Uh, for labor, we get the same. We also use these networks. Basically, we get a 4% reduction in employment uh, in the affected areas and a 3% in the very connected areas, so labor relocates away from, from these areas. And when you look at the sectoral composition, in the areas directly affected by the shock, you get a 10% reduction in agricultural employment an 8% increase in manufacturing, a reduction in services. This is the negative demand effect from the, you know, Corden and Neary model. And in terms of the indirect effect, you know, the, where do these migrants go? They go to agriculture, they go to services, and they don't go to manufacturing in these connected regions. Um, so this is the asymmetry that I was referring to at the beginning that we explore, that we, you know, why is it that um, when they migrate out, they don't go to uh, manufacturing, which is, of course, the sector with the higher wages and the better jobs. So it, it would be nice if they were going there. Um, so we go to the firms, okay? So the first thing we do is to construct this firm exposure to um, these migrant networks. So 
what's the firm exposure to past migration from a given municipality is the share of workers in firm I that in the past came from municipality O to M. We can do this because we have the social security data where we can track uh, workers across time. And then uh, the first finding is that, uh, you know, the firms in agriculture tend to be much more connected to regions that will dry than in manufacturing. Uh, again, the explanation for this, given that the weather shocks are randomly assigned, the explanation for this is that manufacturing is concentrated, so it's going to be less connected uh, to regions, um, to any region. So in particular to regions drying, but to any region because of concentration. So this is a, a, oops, a spatial friction that is going to dif make it more difficult uh, you know, for workers to relocate away from agriculture in these uh, developing countries. And then we use this to shock the firms and see how they respond to these, um, to these shocks. And basically what we find is that uh, even if they are connected because they have some worker that came in the past from this region, so they have the referral, manufacturing is going to react much less to, uh, to the shock than agriculture and services, so they react less, most likely because of the skill mismatch. And by size, we also find that smaller firms are more likely to hire these workers than larger firms, okay? Also, most likely due to these uh, differences in skill. Okay, so these workers tend to go to agriculture and tend to go to small firms. So not the best, uh, not the best jobs. So let me just conclude. Um, so basically we uh, presented some evidence on the effects of climate change on capital and labor relocation. Uh, our main finding is that a full decade of excess dryness uh, relative to historical average generates relocation of capital and labor away from affected regions. It also changes the structure of the economy. Within regions, workers go to manufacturing, and across regions, they tend to go to agriculture and services. And uh, you know, the firm level data identifies a key friction for this uh, relocation process in developing countries, which is the not you know, within regions where we see this relocation, but across regions, so on space, there is a friction uh, to this relocation process from uh, agriculture to manufacturing. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think um, the the I think the point is about a relative versus absolute comparative advantage, right? So think that manufacturing and agricultural productivity are fixed, and then you get a negative shock to agricultural productivity, right? Uh, that's going to mean that relative comparative advantage is better in manufacturing, so people reallocate, but you would still get lower income in this region because productivity is lower. So that's... Yes. 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 The what? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. 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 
Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let me show you because we have a balance table that I skipped. So let me show you that. Yes, so what do we do here? We are comparing different municipalities, right? Um, so on top you have the number of reported droughts in each municipality. And as you see, that's gonna be correlated with a lot of municipality characteristics, like share of rural population, income per capita, um, suitability for soy and suitability for maize, right? Which are the two crops that boomed uh, during this time in Brazil. Uh, so basically, areas that were more prone to droughts, they were also more suitable for soy and maize and you know, poorer in, in terms of income per capita. So this is why we do not use directly the reported droughts as our measure of climate shock. And we use this deviation of dryness from the 100 year average. So what the lower panel shows here is that this uh, dryness index, which is these deviations, um, here we divide it by dryness smaller and larger than the median. And you see that these regions are not different in any of these characteristics, basically, okay? Uh, so basically, we are comparing regions that have a similar level of development and that have a similar agricultural productivity for maize and soy, which are the crops that boomed. And then you are, we are looking at the differential effect of the weather in, this, in these different regions. Okay, the idea is that all these uh, you know, trends are not correlated with our weather shocks, so we are not capturing that in the, in the empirical analysis. The aggregate effect. We can do that. Um, okay, so we can do that uh, to the extent that uh, we assume that um, the indirect effects are captured fully by our measure of connections. Okay, under this assumption, this is a bit what uh, Dave Donaldson and, the, uh, and Hornbeck do in the Railroads paper. No? To the extent that you believe that. So if you believe that, that the indirect effects, then we can do it. And, they, and we've done it here, so let me show you. This is what we've done in this. Um, we haven't added it, though, but we, we did it at least. This would be the, no, the distribution here. So what's the total effect on employment? It's the direct plus the indirect effect. Again, if you believe that, you know, these matrices capture the full interconnections across municipalities, which is a big assumption. If the, there is a recent paper by Arcolakis, uh, Adao, and Esposito that make this point. Okay, so once you do this, then you can calculate the total effect. So this would be the distribution of the total effect in the first decade on employment. So some areas gain employment and some areas lose ex employment. No, this would be the redistribution. And then, what we find interesting is to compare, for example, with the dry decade, which is in red. If you look at the estimates, but plug in the weather shocks of the dry decade that are more uh, dispersed, then you get much, uh, you know, much larger labor relocation across space. So th th you could calculate the total effects by doing this of all our estimates, but under this assumption. Um, this is something we haven't done in the paper, because, you know, we don't want to <laughs> fully believe in this assumption, but maybe we'll just do it and make it clear that under this strong assumption, you can calculate the total effects. Yes. Let's see what number we get. We haven't done it. It's, but I'm sorry? Yes. 
that's very interesting. No, no, but we should take a look. Yes. The, yeah, we should take a look at this. This is very interesting. Um, yes, yeah, that's, a, that's something we haven't done, and that, that would be very interesting. To, so I'll try to find the, the paper. Thanks. Yes. Reduce CO2 emissions. <laughs> that's my policy recommendation. No, no, I mean, uh, I guess that's one message that, you know, the, the effects are large already and that, you know, we should be more, you know, active in the, in the climate policy and reducing the redu action of emissions. So Sorry? Yes, yeah, of course, of course, yes, yes, of course, yes, yes, definitely, uh, definitely. But for me, this is kind of a sign of, of suffering in, you know, in these affected regions, right, and, and difficulties of these migrants to find good jobs at destination. Um, so th that's one of the messages. Another message is that uh, this relocation process in developing countries is subject to these frictions. And then that is one area where policy should focus, right? So if you're having, you know, drought in certain regions, then make sure that, you know, in the big cities close by where uh, migrants uh, are, are going, the government can put employment offices and try to match them better with manufacturing, for example. That would be one clear implication of, of the finding of this friction, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's very, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true, actually. Yeah, and the nice thing is that the extreme, the, the, a lot of the, the places that get wetter, they are flat, and then you get the big losses. So I think that would be a nice number. That's a very good idea. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much for putting this paper on the program. We're going to talk about the expectations channel of climate change and implications for monetary policy, which is joint work with Alex Dietrich, who is also here in the room, and Gernot Müller. And I believe the data was collected while I was at the Fed, so the usual disclaimer applies. Uh, you know, climate change is certainly, we have to explain, it's a hotly debated topic, and it's uh, also a rising challenge for policymakers, um, which includes monetary policymakers. Um, so, for example, Lael Brainerd, early on in 2019, said that it is vital for monetary policymakers to understand the nature of climate change disturbances to the economy, as well as their likely persistence and rights in order to respond effectively. Um, and there are follow up quotes. Um, policymakers around, around the world. Um, now, this is obviously a very difficult task um, because the full consequences of climate change might only materialize within decades from now, um, if not at longer horizons. Um, but uh, I think at the same time, expectations of, about climate change can influence our decisions already today. Um, and this happens obviously much earlier than the um, potential full impact of physical changes. Um, and because if we change our activity today, um, then this is obviously of concern for monetary policymakers. Um, so to think about this, uh, how climate change expectations come into this relationship between climate change and monetary policy, I think it's like a picture uh, is better than a thousand words. Um, so on the one side, you have this question whether monetary policy can actively influence climate change, and um, the answer is probably not so much. As we know, it is a fiscal problem with externalities in the first place. Uh, but on the other hand, there is this sense, obviously, that climate change uh, is a risk, and uh, policymakers have to evaluate financial stability risk. So this comes in in that sense. Um, for me, uh, or in my courses, the, the obvious elephant here in the room is that climate change can also matter in a more traditional understanding of monetary policy where expectations are 
of climate change uh, can affect our demand decisions and you know we care about expectations in our model and, and demand and we show in this paper uh, using a survey and the simple new Keynesian model that this can be a quantitatively potentially quantitatively relevant effect um, um, so uh, if you think about uh, climate change um, uh, you know why should we think about expectations so I'm giving you two, two figures here uh, the left shows uh, for the US as an annual um, frequency the accumulated cost of natural disasters um, and on the right you see different measures of, of media uh, attention to climate change topic and you see a very strong upwards trend uh, which suggests that obviously the uh, people's expectations formation will be affected by these trends um, and when we look at uh, our survey we find um, that um, uh, for the representative US consumers there's a small negligible um, business cycle uh, impact uh, of climate change on GDP growth 20 basis points uh, but at the same time consumers have expectations of that are pretty, pretty uh, or beliefs that are very large about natural disasters uh, with sizable variation at a high frequency um, and so, so natural disasters in particular seem to be a salient feature of, of climate change um, and in the model uh, where you take care of these natural disasters uh, you find that increases in disaster expectations can be contractionary sort of in a sentiment sense and uh, they can have a potentially sizable impact of 45 basis points on the natural rate uh, lowering the natural rate um, and you can um, if you look at the variation over the cycle um, you know um, these disaster belief fluctuations may expand a part of business cycle fluctuation and we solidify sort of analysis also by looking at some BAR evidence and sort of real variables also so let me go straight to the survey um, so this is part was is, um, was part of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland's uh, daily consumer survey which I started we have about 28,000 data points here uh, with consumers that are representative according to age region gender race income education and we uh, address any inaccuracy using survey rates and this was run between 2020 and 20 21 at a daily frequency where in addition to the usual questions we added a block on climate change uh, where we asked about um, uh, expectations uh, about the, dis on, on the distribution of GDP growth uh, economic damages both explicitly conditioned on natural disasters um, as well as the, the probability uh, of a large natural disaster so, so terrorists and you know we have obviously these are very sensitive questions so we also make sure we ask about people's ability to assess probabilities here um, and we will have a high and low probability literacy group here um, so let me just show you three three figures um, so uh, our first question asks people what they expect GDP growth to be um, and they have a, a couple of buckets where they um, can can put weights and um, we see um, in this figure for both uh, the entire set of respondents in blue but also the respondents that understand probability or this particular question very well um, that on average there's not much of an effect right so you are in fact uh, 20 basis points but there is sizable disagreement and this is a consistent pattern in both, uh, in both groups um, and, and so our second question asks respondents in particular about the damages they expect uh, over the next 12 months and I should have said sorry that this is also I wrote it here but this is also about the next 12 months so um, again here you don't really see just visually there's any difference between full set of respondents or people who understand probabilities but now you do see a very large average effect uh, people expect damages of about one and a half percent of GDP uh, as, as damages over the next 12 months uh, with a quite heavy tail here as well um, and then sort of a really important question for our model is uh, about the probability of large natural disasters so we ask people as a result of climate change the risk of natural disasters such as hurricanes tropical cyclones droughts wildfires or flooding is likely to increase and the economic damages may be sizable considering the next 12 months what do you think is the probability of a large disaster causing damage of about five percent of GDP and then people can fill in their answer yes 
Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Absolutely. And, you know, we got this question and we, we repeated the same question where we said, uh, it's in the paper in the details, you know, the, you know, the Great Recession was about a contraction of 5%. Uh, so give people some exactly what you had in mind. And, and I, uh, Katrina was not that large. Uh, not that, I think it was 0.6. It's, not, it's one of the larger ones. Um, and I, I have some other treatments, absolutely. Um, and you know, when you, when you look at the answers, um, uh, this is sort of the distribution you get over the probabilities. So in, in red is the group that didn't get any of the treatments. Uh, um, and i talk about some of those. But essentially you can see that um, the median probability is about 10%. Um, for, for a large rare disaster, which is, you know, you could think is large. Um, and, you know, just to show you also, again, here, the dis differentiation between people who understand probabilities and who do not, um, which is the, the top versus the bottom panel, or it's the, the other way around, you see very similar answers here, you know. So the disaster probability, as well as for the other questions, um, they're actually not significantly different from one another. Uh, the interesting part that we'll exploit um, for some of our analysis is plotting this at the daily frequency. Um, and so here we're plotting moving averages over 11 days. And that's the left panel in red. And, and in the background, you have obviously the, the daily series. And you see the series moves a lot. So people's beliefs change. Um, you know, I wish I had more data in, over the last year or like this summer. Uh, I'm sure you would see a, a lot more spikes. And you know, you can see. A, didn't put any specific events, but you know, the Texas snowstorm is somewhere here. And, uh, um, the interesting part then is that the series correlates very highly with uh, uh, weekly Google searches for natural disasters. Um, so we can use that in particular later on because these Google searches go back a lot further and potentially continue. Um, you know, a question similar to one you just raised is, you know, these crazy numbers. Um, you know, if you've run surveys, people put all kinds of numbers. Um, you know, this is, this is very good questions. Obviously, we know that subjective beliefs are arguably a lot more pessimistic than, than objective probabilities. And we know there's overestimation of small probability events, right? Um, so this is behavioral. And um, it happens along other dimensions, too. Right? So, so I've done some work um, on death probabilities. And it's obviously tied to heuristics um, that people overstate probabilities of rare events. You know, it's sort of easier to recall or it's more frequent. Um, and it's links, and we're going to show this to personal experience, coverage in the media, uh, and different types of risk and availability. Uh, uh, but in, in our model, we're just going to focus on adjustment dynamics uh, given this set of beliefs, uh, and we are sort of agnostic. What is the, what are the true beliefs here? We're sort of more interested in the in the fluctuations. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you some evidence that this is also consequential for decisions. So I'm going to go through a, a couple of tables and uh, uh, figures trying to, to make these links. So first of all, these seem reasonable re responses in the sense that we capture actual uh, correlations with socioeconomic variables. Uh, so in the columns, you have the three questions, the growth impact, uh, the damages, and the disaster probability. And then some socio-demographics. And I have more um, correlates in, in other figure, figure, uh, tables. So you can see that women, for example, uh, estimate somewhat higher damages uh, than men and believe in, in or have a higher probability uh, by about four percentage points. Um, and then older people tend to think there's actually a positive growth impact um, by about 30 basis points. Um, and consistently, they also say, you know, there's less damages. Um, and you see some effects on, on income uh, as well. Now, there's obviously other variables where we might have prior beliefs. Uh, so here's political affiliation, again, for the three questions we ask. And you know, from, from the survey literature, we know that this, this can matter a lot. Uh, so here again, consistently, you see that, um, for example, Democrats expect 1.6% uh, uh, higher probability, percentage points higher probability on average, while Republicans relative to independents have lower disaster beliefs. Um, and also consistently believe that the damages are, are smaller. Um, 
And then, you know, there's some evidence where we ask people have, have they been personally affected in their lives um, by climate change and, 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 and so on. And you see that in, in various forms of these questions, there are significant effects from experiences. And actually, most of these were well, those were speaking to this personal experience uh, uh, role. And in particular, we can drill down a little bit more. Someone earlier mentioned um, fires. So, you know, we can look at, because um, we have uh, geolocated data, right, the, the experience of wildfires, hurricanes, whether, you know, some, there's some official indicators for different states. So these are the different variables you see going down here. And uh, for these disaster reliefs, they tend to be related to uh, hurricane risk mostly. Um, and obviously, this, the, the, the sample could be a little bit larger, right, and, uh, and uh, drilling down to these detailed levels. But there are some significant effects on the personal level uh, from geography. Um, and you see very strong impact uh, effects of uh, news. You know, if, if so, then this literature this, uh, tends out to have a large effect um, on beliefs. In particular, um, you know, if you uh, do not consume news, um, uh, either by not having a, following any major TV station, that's the first row, uh, you see a, a about three percentage point reduction in these beliefs. Uh, we call this sort of a median of, of 10%. Uh, or if you don't read a newspaper, it's sort of in a similar magnitude. But these things um, are also additive, which you see in the last row. So you get a about, uh, cut in half from these, these beliefs. Uh, uh, maybe it's not surprising that this makes things more salient and affects our beliefs, but you know, there's, there's some, some strong evidence. And I should also say that we control for all kinds of other demographics that I've shown you earlier here, uh, as well as state and month uh, fixed effects. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a, another story. And um, we try to establish a little bit of a causal relationship here by doing information treatments, just sort of solidifying these associations. Particularly, we have uh, four treatments, plus the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we give people a newspaper treatment which uh, basically presents them with an extract from the USA Today that talks about the 2020 hurricane season on the East Coast, and in the Gulf region, and wildfires on, on the West Coast. And I would have loved to repeat this like in this, this summer or, or last, last summer. Um, we also give them two um, history treatments. They give them information on the size of disasters. So it would be Hurricane Katrina um, would be implicitly in there, or the frequency of such, such events. And you, know, you can see that. Um, in the, for example, in the past 20 years, to answer your question, there's been about 197 events, but they were all less than 1% of GDP. Um, um, and then we also give them a policy treatment. So we couldn't give them a US policymaker uh, in the survey because it was sponsored by the Fed. So we choose Lagarde, who said that you know, she wants essentially explore every avenue available in order to combat climate change. So it's a strong statement, and we see how people react. And then the, the last treatment is to give them idea what this magnitude of these uh, disaster, uh, large disasters are that, that we're asking them about. So you see that these information treatments shift uh, people's responses consistently with uh, the survey evidence. Uh, so in particular, you see that um, when you present them with uh, examples of, of large disasters, that uh, their probability assessment increases. Um, if you give them historic information, you see a, a negative response, in particular on the size side, not so much on the frequency. They revised their beliefs downward by quite, quite, quite a substantial amount. Um, the policymaker, uh, I would say, ten, tends to make them a little bit more worried. Um, you know, depends a little bit on how, how you think policy combination is, is perceived, or whether people think the policymaker has some information that people don't, don't have. Um, and there's not much of an effect on actually telling them how large the 5% are. Um, and again, we control for, for a lot of factors here. Um, and the question is, okay, these are beliefs, you know, you, do people act on them? <laughs> like, we ultimately do not observe, I want to be very clear, their, their exact uh, consumption decisions, but we can ask them about their behavior, and I'm going to give you an additional piece of evidence that speaks uh, also to some real variables. So, I'm just going to show you one slide here with uh, three panels um, and where we ask people about their uh, choices to eat no or less meat due to climate change, to refrain from flight travel due to climate change, or to avoid plastic products 
due to climate change. Um, and then what you see on the y-axis is the probability um, of a large natural disaster that they, uh, that they, they hold. And then you can see a very clear pattern uh, that the people who report behavior that, uh, you know, you think is in relation uh, to climate change, to, for example, to refrain from flight travel, uh, that they hold a higher belief that there will be large natural disasters. And it's consistent across all of these questions. And there are three more that relate uh, to financial variables, you know, di di divestment and, and, and variables like that. Um, so this is, this is consistent with people adjusting their behavior. Um, now you never know what people actually do. Um, so uh, we run a, a VAR um, where we can get at basically the aggregate, some of the ag aggregate real variables um, where we use uh, this variable that I pointed to earlier, um, namely this, this Google, um, Google search metric that goes back a lot longer, uh, but that is really highly correlated with our probability question. Um, and we use monthly data from 2004 to 2020. Um, you know, there, there's obviously in this VR six time series, the, the natural disasters, the interest rate, uh, personal consumption expenditures, um, and unemployment as well as uh, ac actual costs. And, you know, it's, it's the standard identification. Uh, we allow for an immediate response of indicators to expectations, and we consider a shock to the uh, natural disaster search. So that's the set of impulse responses uh, I will show you next. And uh, you see that, you know, following this belief shock, um, uh, that unemployment increases, uh, the interest rate uh, goes down, consumption falls. Um, so these are very, very significant responses. CPI falls, uh, and the uh, you know, GDP obviously in, is an index that falls. So this suggests that this at least this uh, proxy variable for, for these probability uh, assessments is, has some, uh, some association with, uh, uh, with real choices as well. Um, I, again, ideally we'd like to look at, at micro data, but you know, we don't, don't observe this. So what, what do we do with this? Uh, what, what does this imply for monetary policy? Um, so we're going to look uh, at this through the lens of a Lucasian model with rare disasters and following essentially the setup of Fernandez Via Verde and, and Leventhal. And I try to keep this uh, short. Um, we have a simplified version to get some intuition, um, but we also calibrate a, um, a more a full model uh, to get a little bit more of a quantitative assessment. And how this works is literally in your uh, sort of Galice style world, uh, but there is a natural disaster in this model um, where the probability of climate change is related to the uh, probability of a disaster. So the probability of GT being one and this G omega. So, uh, and what happens is so essentially this, right? You lose some of your capital stock and your productivity drops. Um, are there other ways to think about this? Um, we're just focusing on this particular transmission channel. Um, I guess uh, I'm just gonna point out where, for the sake of time also the where this enters the, uh, the, the usual uh, equation. So uh, you know, consumers maximize utility subject to budget constraint, capital accumulation, subject to adjustment costs, but if this disaster strikes, you lose this fraction mu t of your capital, and mu t can evolve according to some process. So you have an AR1, um, and uh, like I just said, you, your productivity drops also if this disaster strikes. So this is the growth rate of, of productivity. Um, um, so let me just go to some closed form results and then the, the, some impulse responses. Uh, the simplifying assumptions we make to get closed form results, uh, you know, we really sim simplify this, this problem. Households maximize expected utility. There's basically um, prohibitive investment costs, uh, no depreciation, so there are no dynamics of capital. There's no trend in growth productivity, and uh, the disaster is not time varying. Uh, and then we back sort of in the Gali model with the Phillips curve and IS equation, and then you can show some, some results. Uh, so I have three slides. So the first one is that the natural rate of interest drops in response to bad news. Um, and this is tied both to the uh, magnitude of the disaster as well as to the, the likelihood of, of the disaster. Um, so the solution you get is that the natural rate uh, depends not only on the preference parameter, and then again, you know, there's no 
no trend growth here, but you get a negative relation um, with the probability and the size of the natural disaster, and then there's some proportionality parameters here. Uh, so what's the intuition? Uh, well, you know, something uh, bad is, if you think something bad is gonna happen in the future, this is gonna affect uh, your decisions, right? You particularly wanna smooth out your consumption, so you have to save today, and it's gonna depress the natural rate um, of, of, of interest. Um, at the same time, if the disaster hasn't happened, there's no effect to the natural level of output, uh, but if, if there is a, such, an, uh, such a disaster, obviously the natural output uh, contracts. Uh, now what does monetary policy do in, uh, in face of such disasters? Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, they generally we assume that monetary policy follows an interest rate rule uh, where you can react, implement, or respond systematically to the natural rate of interest uh, as well as inflation. And uh, there's a probability that you get the effective lower bound. And then there's sort of three cases, and we sort of all know this, but this is, this is very, I think, uh, illuminating for what, what the effect should be. So, you know, if you perfectly implement a natural rate, then you can uh, you know, stabilize uh, the economy. Uh, now, if you don't quite do that, but have some kind of Taylor rule, uh, then, you know, there's some deviations, an output gap opens up, um, and there is uh, inflation, um, uh, and uh, this scenario gets worse, the, the, the less you respond. Uh, in the worst case, if you don't respond at all, um, you have a bigger output gap and um, uh, a larger deviation for inflation. So you can, this is sort of, uh, what we get intuitively. And then notice that these, um, sorry, I should have said this, that deviations depend obviously on, the, on these probabilities, omega t, um, and that tells you also that the volatility, so the, um, the fluctuations over the cycle depend on the, on the magnitude of these, these probability beliefs. And uh, you just take these other equations and take the variance so to, to get these results. And I think I have to finish up very quickly. Um, so, if we calibrate this to our model, so take a disaster size of mu is 0.05, and then beliefs at a quarterly frequency of, of 2.5% probability of such a disaster hitting, um, and uh, take also the distribution, the, the higher moments from the data, um, and then we match sort of business cycle moments, and uh, uh, I'll just show you the the key results and then one figure and then I have the time. So, so basically targeting these moments, uh, we can see very easily that uh, uh, fluctuations in belief um, may explain some part of uh, the business cycle. So how do you see this? So in a model without ex disaster expectations, um, so if these are the, uh, these are the moments we, we get from simulation, um, uh, with, with disaster expectation and taking disaster expectations out, you see uh, quite quite a difference um, in these moments, also in line with the simple proposition that I've shown you. Um, so you see a particular large drop in the natural rate um, and a little bit of an output gap. And uh, you see that you know, overall we explain some share of fluctuation. If it's too large, I would say this is crazy, but this, you know, this is, I think this is a, is a an example of these new sentiments that we can actually measure. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, and then you can obviously look at the impulse responses where you very clearly see that uh, mon the choice of monetary policy, how monetary policy responds in this full model also has uh, predictions in line with this simple intuition. So I'm showing you here uh, one standard deviation shock uh, as we measure it to these disaster beliefs and uh, Three cases, one where you have a, uh, our baseline policy, then implementing the natural rate, as well basically as not responding as a policy maker. And you can see that in all cases, uh, that you know, the, the natural rate drops, right? That's the one we'd like to implement. But then how the economy actually responds depends quite a bit on, on the monetary policy choices. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, if this probability of the disaster increases, you know, investment becomes a more risky, so you see less of it in all cases. Uh, and if you are uh, implementing the natural rate, you sort of 
doing a good job at stabilizing the economy. Um, and once you deviate this from this, this optimal policy, uh, you see uh, obviously that uh, uh, inflation is, is not perfectly stabilized anymore. And, uh, quite in, in line with the predictions of the simple model, this, this gets worse the less you react. Um, so to, to sum up, um, if you measure these, ex these beliefs about climate change, um, sort of find very small but slightly positive growth effects, um, but also very large uh, um, disaster beliefs and also in terms of magnitudes, um, and they tend to be very salient. And uh, it means for policy that, you know, shifts in these beliefs can contribute potentially to, to business cycle fluctuations. Um, you know, we have to see, you know, what, how, how these beliefs evolve. But I think this is this really neatly linked to this idea of, of, of sentiment shock that we can, can measure. Um, thank you. Okay. And today I'm here to talk about uh, our study titled Climate Change Risk and the Transmission of Monetary Policy. And I'm Takeshi Shinohara from <coughs> Bank of Japan. Okay, let me start with the introduction. So, <coughs> as you already know, the uh, risks of climate change have been strongly raised and becomes uh, one of the greatest challenges recently. And central banks are more considering the climate change, such as Green QE, for example, monetary policy framework that, uh, that has been proposed for mitigating climate change. Now, following this uh, trend, another issue uh, has emerged regarding uh, monetary policy and climate change risks. And that is whether uh, climate change risks affect the monetary policy transmission, uh, that conventional monetary policy transmission. So <clears throat> in 2021, 20, uh, Christian Lagarde uh, raises the question of whether the uh, physical risks related to climate change uh, will damage the uh, transmission of monetary policy. So our study is about just this uh, point. So before speaking about our uh, study, uh, we summarize what literatures have pointed out. First, uh, uncertainty is a broad, range, broad concept. Uh, in macroeconomics, uh, the typical uncertainty or risk is about macroeconomic uncertainty or risk. This is, for example, uncertainty about the uh, outlook for GDP growth or stock market volatility. <coughs> in addition, and climate change risk <coughs> can be uh, regarded as a kind of such uncertainty or risk. But, <coughs> And second, there are a lot of research on whether uh, general economic uncertainty or risk damages monetary policy transmission, both empirical and theoretical. In general, these studies point out that uncertainty and risk uh, reduce the effectiveness of monetary policy. However, uh, empirical analysis uh, suggests that economic and employment, uh, economic uncertainty doesn't affect monetary policy uh, effects on the uh, inflation. On the theoretical side, the reliability of investment and employment is regarded as one of the key mechanisms. Under high uncertainty, the value of uh, wait and see increases, uh, so uh, called real option theory. So, and thus, uh, firms will not invest even if uh, monetary easing, easing uh, improves the financial environment. However, 
to the best of our knowledge, uh, the relationship between uh, climate change risks or, and monetary policy transmission, and this is the subject of our study, it has not yet been studied. <clears throat> so to begin with, uh, can general economic uncertainty risk and climate change risk have different, different effects on monetary policy? They are different as uh, the macroeconomic uncertainty risk is uh, uh, unpredictable future conditions and climate change risk is the physical risks or uh, physical risk or uh, transition risk. So the rut is characterized by the risks that occur slowly over a long period and that leads to irreversible uh, changes. This is the future uh, not present in the general economic uncertainty. Therefore, this study is positioned to fill this gap. Related studies, uh, although few in number, have also emerged recently. So one such study is that of Gatorade et al. Um, presented earlier. So their study is very informative. Uh, it focuses on whether climate change risk impedes macroeconomic activities and to what extent multiple policy can eliminate their adverse effects. But uh, not study on uh, how much monetary policy is affected by climate change risk. So what we do, uh, this slide shows what we have done in this study. First, we conduct, conduct two empirical analysis. Uh, the first one, the, we construct an index that captures the uh, attention to climate change risks for Japan. The Engel and his colleagues originally developed the index for the U.S. And now we apply this method to Japan. In the second part of the empirical analysis, we estimate the smooth transition local projection model between uh, high and low climate change risk regime. We use the data from the U.S. and Japan with other robustness check. With this analysis, we investigate whether climate change risk has a negative impact on monetary policy spillovers. And finally, uh, we built a theoretical model to interpret the uh, empirical findings. Crime, uh, that is, climate change risk could affect uh, monetary policy through various channels. And here we uh, construct a simple new Keynesian model uh, through, uh, uh, with uh, expectation of disasters. So uh, this is our findings. Uh, so the findings of this study is that monetary policy <coughs> spillovers uh, reduced as climate change risk is higher. Specifically, we find that the response of the price to monetary policy shocks uh, in addition to economic activities such as production and capital investment or uh, the GDP is weakened. This result differs so, from those using macroeconomic uncertainty or risk, which have been primary, <coughs> primarily studied in the past. And results are robust in the U.S. and Japan. We interpret that a key mechanism is the wait and see effect. Okay, so let's start the empirical analysis part. The first part of the empirical analysis is the construction of an index that captures the attention to climate change or Japan. Okay, we first uh, explained uh, about climate change risk attention index called CRA index. Uh, 
this index was originally proposed by Engel et al. for the US uh, based on uh, textual uh, analysis on newspaper articles. The index is constructed by calculating uh, correlation between newspaper and climate change vocabulary. And we can interpret it that it represents a fraction of news about climate change risk. Our first contribution is that we construct uh, the CRA index for Japan. Okay, and data, and we applied Engel's method to major Japanese newspaper articles for the first time. So data source is uh, one of Japan's major newspapers called Minus Shinbun with all articles from 1991 to 2021. Okay, so here, the, we first the, uh, show the climate change risk index for the US uh, created by Engel at all. The blue thin line is the monthly original series and the black line is the six month moving average. And looking at this, uh, three points can be noted. The first one is we can see that the index fluctuates and rising and falling uh, repeatedly. It indicates that uh, the perception of climate change risk may increase and decrease. Next, the index has risen immediately during international events related to, the, to climate change, such as uh, Copenhagen Accords in January 21, 2010, so, and third national climate assessment in 2014. And lastly, it is on rising trends in the US after 2000 years. Next, this is the same index for Japan. The index shows that it, uh, it rises sharply during events such as adaptation to Kyoto Protocol uh, in December 1997 and the Copenhagen Code in January. So this is common in Japan and the United States. Also, uh, looking at the recent period, the index has been declining since the beginning of 2020 due to the COVID-19. But it has been rising sharply since uh, next year to 2021, reflecting the recent increase in the uh, attention to climate change risk. Uh, conversely, the index for Japan differs from the US in that it is not a rising trend in Japan. It can be uh, interpreted that the uh, development of attention to climate change risks may differ from each country. So we then uh, studied the relationship between climate change risk and monetary policy transmission. In the smooth transition local projection model, using the CRA index, this is, a, this is our main finding. Okay, first, we describe the specification of the analysis. In this study, uh, we estimate the smooth transition local projection uh, the general local projection estimates only the uh, first part of the equation. Uh, oh. Oh, oh, this, the, only this point. Uh, the, the response of each variable, variable to a particular stroke with uh, the beta red, red beta. The smooth transition local projection assumes here that the response to the shock varies depending on the state and estimates the response in each state. 
the responses are the least beta H and beta L in this equation. The regimes are calculated from the climate risk index that I showed in the previous uh, slide. Uh, we employ the logistic function as in this equation, and the climate risk index is transformed to regimes for high and low climate change risk. And theta is the uh, parameter that determines how strongly the regimes switch. Theta is calibrated to five uh, following previous studies at the baseline. And the, the estimation period is 1997 to 2019. And the drug length is determined by uh, AICs. Okay, next, we explain the data uh, used in the estimation. The economic variables are the IIP, fishy deflator, and the indices of capital invest investment and consumption. And oh, in addition to corporate bond spread. And all is seasonal adjusted and regressive labor. And we use mass monetary policy shocks estimated in previous studies for Japan and the US respectively. Both shocks are extracted from uh, financial market movements around the monetary policy meeting, such as uh, FOMC, FOMC. And finally, the regime variable is uh, the share rate index, as mentioned earlier. Okay, so this slide has shown the uh, possibility of regime of high climate change risk calculated mechanically. The upper row is the uh, United States and the lower is the Japan. In the United States, in the upper panel, is uh, until the mid, uh, mid 2000s, the US was in a regime of low uh, climate change risk. And after it, uh, had, it has been usually in a regime of high climate change risk after uh, 2010 or so. On the other hand, looking at Japan on the low panel, in the late 1990s, Japan is a regime of high climate change risk. And on the contrary, in the 2000s, it is a regime of low climate change risk. After that, high climate change risk regime continues with uh, minor uh, fluctuation. So the regimes of high and low climate change risk may be uh, different in uh, you, uh, countries. So here we show the response of each variable to monetary policy shock in the US. The first, uh, the upper panel shows the results to linear local projection model without uh, considering regime switches. The upper panel shows the responses of output, prices, and investment or consumption to the uh, contractionary monetary policy shocks, respectively. The shaded area means 90% confidence land. And each variable declining significantly in response to a positive monetary policy shock consistent with uh, general economic failure. Next, in the lower panel, we show the semester transition local projection estimates, estimation. The blue dotted line here shows the response in the regime of lower attention, lower attention to climate change risk. Each variable decreases in response to a positive monetary policy shock similar to response in the linear uh, model in the upper panel. Uh, in other words, the effects of monetary policy are well propagated in regimes with low attention to climate change risk. On the other hand, how about the response in regimes with 
high uh, climate change risk. So this is indicated by this red line. It shows that in the regime of high attention climate change risk, the, uh, the response to monetary policy shock is small and no significant. This result is the same with all variables, including prices, investment, and consumption. This contrasts with the regime of high climate change risk, and which is a uh, blue dotted line. Moreover, uh, the responses in the two regimes are different enough to be uh, significantly uh, different. Um, this is, uh, and this result is robust to changing uh, theta, the parameter of smoothness of regime switches, and the lag order of the expressionary uh, variable. Okay. We employ the same estimate for Japan. First, in the upper panel, we show the response to a monetary policy shock in a linear model where each variable is significant country reduced consistency with theory and the results in the U.S. In the bottom panel, we show the response of the local production and regimes is uh, low attention climate change risk. The blue, as in the linear model, all variables are reduced by a positive monetary policy shock. Okay, next, the response in the regime with high crime change risk, shown by the red line in the bottom panel, is not significantly responsible to monetary policy shock. This is uh, uh, consistent with uh, US and Japan. Okay, so finally, a simple, uh, there are a um, variety of um, positive, possible channels to behind this empirical finding. This, is, this table is uh, from the 2021 reports by the EBCB. This is argued that, this argued that climate change risk can affect monetary policy transmission through uh, various channels. For example, uh, lending by financial institutions or asset prices, such as land and stock prices in certain sectors. They, uh, we focused on the expectation channel. The expectation channel means that climate change risk should, could reduce the uh, predictability to future demand and supply and damage the monetary policy effectively. All of these channels can be in included in the framework, the empirical analysis, and that our study. Uh, but uh, next section, in the model part, we focused on the expectations channel. Okay, finally, our uh, simple and toy model identifies um, possible mechanisms, uh, especially XR. Uh, expectation channels. Okay, this is model's overview. First, uh, as you can see in the first uh, portion, it is based on the standard New Keynesian model. Basically, uh, it assumes an exchanging type utility function and introduces uh, capital investment adjustment cost and Lot and bag price adjustment cost as uh, VGT. And the key feature of this model is that it takes into account the risk of uh, natural disasters. The model defines that natural disasters can damage capital and productivity by a certain percentage. Uh, this setting is the uh, same as previous study such as uh, this is or sorry. 
In addition, we assume that the natural disaster occurs in a certain probability in the model. Okay, specifically, as in this, case, <coughs> this slide, so we ex expect D to be one, the occurrence of a disaster. Uh, we expect that the occurrence of a disaster will result in a uh, death uh, percentage loss of capital and productivity. This is uh, strongly factored into expectation formation as the probability of disaster occurrence increases. Here, uh, we assume that as uh, household or firms, perception of climate change risk increases. They strongly uh, affect in the occurrence of disasters, which is uh, with an increase in the probability of disaster occurrence. However, this doesn't mean that a disaster will actually occur, but only that households and farms will change their expectations by uh, introducing in the possibility of future disaster. This slide uh, shows parameters. Uh, we will not go into details, but the bottom line data is the probability of disaster occurrence and we look at how response to monetary policy shock is affected when data is varied. Okay, uh, this is uh, the response, uh, this is the model uh, impulse responses. And each variable to a monetary <coughs> uh, response to uh, uh, each mine uh, easing uh, monetary policy shocks. So, since this is a negative monetary policy shock, so each variable is increasing or uh, rising. Here, the uh, thick black line is, uh, indicates the case where the probability of disaster is uh, set to zero, which economic agents perceive the risk of climate change to be uh, or uh, ultimately low. On the other hand, the red dotted line and the blue dash uh, dotted line show the response when the probability of disaster occurrence increases when the climate change risk uh, means uh, climate change risk mean, uh, is increases. The response of each variable is smaller for the red dotted line and the blue dotted line than for the black. In other words, the Celtica model confirms that as the risks of climate change increases, it affects the formation of people's uh, expectations and the spillover uh, transmission of monetary policy becomes uh, weaker. There are many uh, other possible channels through uh, which climate change risks can affect monetary policy uh, transmission. So such as a financial channel. But if these, cha if these channels are taken into account, so the impact of climate change risks on monetary policy could be uh, more, may more be more larger. Okay, and finally, we summarize this study. In this study, uh, we developed an index capturing attention to climate change risk for Japan. Uh, using this study, uh, using this index, we conducted an empirical analysis in the framework of the smooth transition local project to determine how the, how the transmission of monetary policy are affected when attention to climate change uh, risk increases. As a result, it was confirmed in both the US and Japan that the effect of monetary policy was uh, reduced when climate change risk increases. And one possible mechanism for this study, uh, this result is the expectations channel through uh, wait and see. And future research uh, could, for example, uh, 
apply the empirical graph part of the minute transition uh, VL. By doing so, the relationship between uh, climate change risk and other shock, uh, such as uh, demand shock or supply shock, can also be uh, analyzed. So uh, that's all.